Hogarth was an outstanding 18th century English artist, printmaker, and social commentator. He would, uh, he would be welcome with us today for his comments on the IPCC. On the right here, you see his interpretation uh, of the fundamentalist religious meetings of the day. And the minister in the pulpit is threatening the congregation with a witch in one hand and the devil in the other, which might, of course, be the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the acidification of the oceans. The congregation is reacting in the way that uh, humans en masse do. They are various states of hysteria and swooning. And the lady in the bottom left corner here is giving birth to rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> and in the bottom right is a diseased brain. Now, in this entire picture, there's one sane person. And that person is outside, smoking a pipe, looking through the window, somewhat bemused at what is going on. For the remainder of this talk, that person is you and me. <laughs> this is the sort of things we're reading in the newspaper. Every credible piece of scientific evidence we now have including that of Australia's peak scientific body, this, the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial and Research Organization, tells us that climate change is accelerating faster than previously feared. That leads me to go to the bookshelf and pull down the dictionary and look up the word science. Well, I find that the first definition is the state or fact of knowing. If you think about that for a moment, that's a sort of state of grace. And it's a state of grace that certainly Al Gore and the IPCC and the CSIRO think they inhabit. But most of us don't use that meaning of science, albeit it's technically valid. Most of us use a definition of science which goes more like this. It's a branch of study which is connected uh, either with a connected body of demonstrated truths or with observed facts which are systematically classified and more or less colligated by being brought under general laws. There's no general law of climate change. Finally, and most importantly in this definition, is the and which. And which includes trustworthy methods for the discovery of new truth. Now, what are those trustworthy methods? And the answer, of course, is the time-honored observations and experiments, so-called empirical science. And we don't do that just for the fun of it. We do that because we wish to test our hypothesis. The hypothesis of the day is that human-caused carbon dioxide emissions are causing dangerous global warming. That is normally put to me by newspaper reporters as, is global warming happening then? <laughs> and this piece of sloppy terminology is one that irritates me intensely because it's code for, is human-caused carbon dioxide emission causing dangerous global warming? That is the hypothesis. And I'm going to test it in five ways. The fact is, and these are the data from the Climate Research Unit, the Hadley Centre in Britain, these are the temperature data that the IPCC uses, and the fact is that since 1998 and 2005, there is no trend, either up or down. We can discuss all night over a whiskey the significance or the interpretation of that fact. But the fact is, for the last nine years now, there's been no increase in global temperature. However, over the same period of time, there's been a 4% increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. What was the hypothesis? The hypothesis was that if you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere extra, it will cause global warming. This is test number one of the hypothesis, and it fails. Well, Bob, well, only a fool would predict long-term climate on that. Indeed, I'm not predicting long-term climate. I'm testing a hypothesis. And of course, that followed this ramp here from 1970 through to 1998, when temperature did increase as plotted by this graph. 
What is the temperature plotted here? It's the ground temperature from the thermometers, or these days the electronic sensors, in the little white steams and boxes. We've already heard most eloquently in at least two talks why that apparent warming trend is almost certainly spurious. Let's look at the best available data we have, the microwave sensing unit satellite data. From 1979 through to 2005, the southern hemisphere, flat as a tack, no warming whatsoever. The northern hemisphere, a very slight warming, and when you average it out globally, an even slighter warming. So not only for the last nine years has there been no significant warning, but against the best database that we have, in reality, against the last uh, 25 or so years, there has not been global warming, but as global warming is both north and southern hemisphere. It's not warming the southern hemisphere, and indeed it's only warmed a very small amount overall against the best data uh, over that period of time. And here's the latest plot from the two different satellite groups. Here's the recent dive away, and you'll see that's a continuation, in fact, of a declining trend now that's been going on uh, actually since 2005. So we are three years into a declining trend. Again, we can argue about whether you think that's a period of time that's significant in climatic terms, but you can't argue about the trend itself. So test number one, then, a requirement of our hypothesis is that if dangerous temperature rises occurring, then temperature rise should be occurring. Well, it's not. If we're going to have dangerous global warming, we have to show that it lies outside the previous range of natural variation. I'm just going to take a recent uh, paper uh, with one uh, set of tree ring data from northern Scandinavia. And we have here 500 AD, 1000, 1500, 2000, so it's the last 1500 years. And here's the uh, moving average of the temperature plot. And what we see is that we can recognize the little ice age, this cooler period in here generally. We can recognize Craig's medieval warm period here. And the 10 red dots are times in the last 1500 years when the temperature in northern Scandinavia has been higher than it is today. Well, tree rings, they've got their problems. So let's move to another sort of paleo data. This is a recent paper by Craig Lurl, who's speaking later today, and Houston McCulloch. And they now go from uh, uh, birth of Christ, from zero through to 2000. Uh, and they uh, take a number of proxies, which include ice cores, uh, lake cores, sea cores, uh, speleothems from caves. And they come up with a, a plot which, again, we can recognize clearly a medieval warm period, a little ice age, and a, a late 20th century warming. And this is less than that. So our second test then, uh, as to whether modern temperature is in any way unusually warm or increasing at an unusually high rate, again, the answer is no. And looking now at 5,000 years of data, uh, we're now looking at the ice core from Greenland. And we go back to the birth of Christ here, 2,000 years, and back to, uh, to 3,000 years BC. We've just looked in the little box here. Here's the little ice age. Here's the medieval warm period. It gets a, a, a green stripe. Uh, the modern warm period gets a green stripe. And so do the earlier warm periods with a periodicity of around 1,500 years. This is the solar cycle that has recently been covered by Dennis Avery and Fred Singer in their book. It's very well established, and so well established that, in fact, all these warm periods have got their own names. Uh, and it's very clear uh, that these uh, periods in here, and here, and here, the points on the graph are warmer than today. So from a whole variety of paleoclimatological evidence all over the world, there is no evidence that the late 20th century warming is in any way unusual, either in the magnitude of the peak or in the rate of warming. 